Good morning, everybody. Welcome to ACWS's basic uh, user training. I do want to go ahead and get started. Um, I think maybe a couple more people might be joining us, uh, but I do want to get started because we have a lot to cover in a short amount of time. So we're going to go ahead and get going. Um, so I'm going to show my screen here. Um, there is a handout in the GoToWebinar panel on the side here. Towards the bottom, uh, you'll see here it's a it's highlighted in red. Um, there, where you will find this PowerPoint if you want to follow along with the PowerPoint as we move through things. Um, I also want to let you know that due to just the way the nature of this webinar, you will be muted <clears throat> in pretty much the entire time. So if you have any questions or something that you want me to know, please use this questions bar here, which is also in the GoToWebinar panel here on the side. Please um, go there, type in your question, shoot it off to me, and then I will receive it. And we'll try to answer it. Um, you can also raise your hand. You can't see that in this picture here, but uh, in the panel there, you should see an option to raise your hand. So if you raise your hand, I can unmute you for a moment. You can ask your question and then I will address it. So there's a couple ways to get my attention throughout the uh, webinar. You can type in your question, you can raise your hand and I will uh, address your concerns. Um, also, um, I will, there will be regular, like, set um, regular uh, points where I will stop and ask if there are any questions, just to make sure that you have a, uh, a, a chance to get that done. Um, so uh, with that out of the way, let's go ahead and get started. That's a little bit of the format for you. Um, so again, this is a outcome tracker basic training for um, basic users in outcome tracker. Uh, I am, my name's Christoph, I work at ACWS, I'm the member support for ACWS, so if you have a problem with Outcome Tracker, it'll likely be me that you will speak to and to try to um, fix that problem. So that's who I am, Christoph, and let's see. Um, just a few things that we want. I want you to let you know before we get started. I know that uh, a lot of the people on the call are new, so um, are not um, very familiar with Outcome Tracker. Um, so the way it works is that your database, um, your shelter's database, is kind of a copy of ACWS's database. But there could have been, and probably somewhere, have been changes that have been made here and there from your, from our database to your database. So not everything will be totally, totally applicable to uh, your database. Um, some have customized data entry tools to um, suit their unique processes. So. Um, the processes we go over may in this in this um, webinar may not 100% match what your shelter looks like, but it should be very very comparable. Um, it should be very close. I've just noticed that there might be a, a little difference here and there between what I show you and what you will actually be doing. So this is what we hope to go over for this uh, webinar. Um, the support resources and protocols, uh, logging into OT and troubleshooting common login errors, accessing existing records, creating new records, entering data on tabs and activities, common data errors, linking women with their children through relationships, and managing records with uh, multiple admissions. Those are some of the common um, issues that basic trainer, that basic users have with when they first start using the database. So these are things that we want to address. Goals for this session. After this session, hopefully, you will be able to log into OT and troubleshoot any login issues that may happen. 
uh, you will be comfortable with creating and accessing client records. Uh, you will be able to link family members through relationships and you will know how to know where you should be entering the different data points. Uh, as well, you will be aware of common data entry errors, understand how to manage data for clients with multiple missions, and um, are aware of the support resources and protocols. Hopefully, um, all of those things that will be true for you after the session. Now, that's a lot of ground to cover in an hour, um, so let's get going. So, this is pretty simple. Um, you have a few support resources available to you um, when you are having difficulties with Outcome Tracker. There are two Outcome Tracker manuals that ACWS has written for its members. Um, so I want to make clear that um, when you log into Outcome Tracker, there's a support tab, and Outcome Tracker, this is the third data point. And in there, there are manuals, but those manuals are written by um, VistaShare, by Outcome Tracker, to be applicable to as many clients as possible. So they're very, they end up being very vague. Whereas the Outcome Tracker manuals that ACWS has written are very specific to its members. So they're, so they end up being, they end up being very specific about um, the data that is in there, um, and end up being way more useful for our members. We find. So if you there are two um, there are two manuals. There's one for basic users and one for admin, administrative users. Um, most likely, you will only need to look at the basic manual, basic users manual. But um, if you need to access those, you can probably talk to your um, uh, administrator. They should have access to those, and they should be able to get you the Outcome Tracker manual. There's also training videos available on the ACWS YouTube channel. Um, if you download the handout, the PowerPoint, this is a link, so you could click on that and it'll take you right to the YouTube channel. But on there, we will have uh, videos for most of the webinars we've done in the last couple years and a few other things that will help you, maybe help you um, in Outcome Tracker. This video, this webinar will also be up on there soon, and a link will be sent out to the OT admins um, to this video, just so, you know, if you want to reference it again, there's something that you didn't quite understand, maybe the first time you want to look at it again, that will be available for you soon to reference. And again, of course, the Vista Share Support tab and Outcome Tracker. This is last on the list because it really should be your last resort. Um, hopefully, uh, what you will do before is review the OT support resources, the uh, ACWS manuals and the training videos. If those don't help, then you would contact your shelter's OT administrator, and then the OT administrator, if they don't know the solution or, or can't help, they'll contact us at this, um, at this web address, at this email address, and that web uh, email address goes to me um, and then I will get back to them other um, otherwise um, if I if I can't find the solution to the problem then I'll go directly to Vista share support but um, we encourage you to not contact Vista share directly because of the licensing agreement that we have in place with Vista share and the sort of special deal that we get um, with them we have agreed to limit direct support requests. So if you have a question, please um, just please understand that going directly to Vista Share Support should be your last resort to get that question answered. Um, there are a few other things that you should try before we get there. Um, so that's the sort of the support protocol. Um, are there any questions or comments about that? Um, you can type in in the questions bar or raise your hand, and I'll just give people a moment to um, to uh, type in a question that they may have.
So I just added this video as a manual just to make it clear what I mean by OT support resources. Um, so this is sort of the process by which you should have any issues that you have in Outcome Tracker be resolved. Um, just so you know, um, access the videos and manuals first. If you can't find your answer in there, then the OT administrator, ask them. If they can't help, they will contact me. And then if I further can't find the, the answer, then I'll contact VistaShare. Um, okay, let's move on. I don't think there are any questions. Um, so let's move on here. So logging into OT. So one of the one of the major things that we have with new, uh, problems that we have with new staff members is that they have sometimes have difficulty logging into Outcome Tracker, and there's just a few little um, things that you want to keep in mind when you are logging into Outcome Tracker that will probably help you out a lot. One is that both your password and your username are case sensitive. It's often the case that your password is case sensitive. In fact, it should always be the case that your password is case sensitive. But it's kind of unusual to see a case where usernames are case sensitive and an outcome tracker usernames are case sensitive. Um, so if you try to log in and you are booted out or you can't log in, it could be that your username is not correct because it's also case sensitive. And they usually, usually follow the format of first name, that last name, no capitals at all. So often we'll have, um, we'll have users who will put in capital, capital F first name, capital L last name, and then their password and not be able to log in without realizing that um, by default, this is what your username will be without capitals. And since it is case sensitive, if you put a capital in there, even though it is, extremely like um, muscle memory even for most of us to capitalize our first name and last name. <laughs> um, if you do, it will not let you log into Outcome Tracker usually. Um, also, people um, will sometimes think that their username is their email address. That is not typically the case. Um, your username you can can be changed and your username might not be this default, um, although at, at mo mo it most likely is. So you might want to check with your OT admin if you try first name, last name without any capital letters and you still get logged that are not not able to log in. Um, and and it's almost certainly not your email address. Like most things, most websites these days, you log in with your email address, but not with Outcome Tracker. Um, after a certain number of failed logins, you will have to reset your password, which your OT admin can help you with. Um, the certain number here, um, it, varies from shelter to shelter. That's why I didn't put a concrete number in there. I think typically it's about five, uh, five failed logins in a row. It, after that, your username will be um, flagged and you will be unable to log in without the help of your OT admin. Um, but um, so if you try two or three times and are un 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 unable to log in, you might want to stop and go to your OT admin just to avoid the um, hassle of having uh, your OT password reset. Um, all right, so those are sort of like basic support and logging in to OT um, things. So with that out of the way, let's dive into Outcome Tracker now. So um, the first thing we want to talk about is accessing existing records. Um, so when you log into Outcome Tracker um, and you have data that you need to enter, you will almost certainly always want to go to the People Organization tab here at the front. Now, also keep in mind that I have, um, as a as an administrator, I have quite a few um, tabs up here that you probably don't, like the setup tab, maybe the forms tab, but you should have people organization. So you'll go there and you'll search for your client. So let's say I have uh, information I want to search, I want to put in for Linda Belcher. These are, of course, all fake names. You can probably tell March Simpson, um, Jane Doe, so on and so forth. Um, one thing I notice right away when I log in is that this role here 
is set to be filtered for adult um, outreach uh, active. So that's great for me because Linda Belcher happens to be an adult active. So, but um, usually what you'll want to do when you log in and search for a person's name is just select all, which is at the very top of this list here. And what that does is that that will allow you to search for the name without any filters on roll, because sometimes, you know, you, you're not sure what role your, your person will have, and you don't want to search for uh, a person who's in the outreach program while you have residential, the residential role selected, um, and things like that. So typically what we advise people to do just to make sure that they're going to get the result that they need is to just select all, which is at the very top. Um, and then let's say I want to do, I want to search for uh, Linda Belcher. And there she is, Linda Belcher. I also see uh, an, uh, a, a name that is approximate match, Tina Belcher, which would be her daughter. Um, but that's not who I want. I want Linda Belcher, so let's click on that. Um, and then that is how you access an existing client record. So you just go to uh, People Organization. Uh, the most important thing to take away is that you make sure that this is on all, and then you search for the name, and you should be able to find it. And... Um, and then um, once you are accessed an exist, existing record, let's say um, Linda Belcher is an outreach client, but I want to make her a residential client. She already is a residential client as well. But let's just say for the sake of argument that she's currently outreach, but she needs to be um, uh, she needs to be put into the residential program. I just removed that role just so I can um, show you exactly what you want to do. So uh, Linda Belcher is graduating from, or maybe graduating is a not accurate word, is moving from the outreach to residential. So I'll go to people organization, search for name selector, just like I did, go to roles, the role tab here. Um, again, this is one of those things, like it might be in a different spot in your database than it is in ours. So just keep in mind that um, it, it might not be like in the bottom uh, left-hand corner for you like it is for us. It might be over here, it might be right here, but uh, as long as it's a, the tab labeled roles, you, sh you should be good. And uh, once you get there, I see that she has an outreach follow-up adult role, and I want to add the role of residential ACWS adult. The begin date will default to whatever date you're entering it, um, and that's fine. And then I click add. Um, so let's say that I know because uh, teen, uh, because Linda is in the residential program that she is no longer in the outreach program. I can put an end date for that role. I'll probably put it for the day before today. And then I see that she that her outreach moves from in active to inactive, which is something you can do. Um, uh, end dates are less important than filling out the discharge. Um, so you can put the end date in if you if you like. Some shelters use the end dates and some shelters don't. They're not as important as filling out the discharge. So you'd want to fill out the discharge before you fill out the intake. Or you want to sorry. You want to uh, fill out the discharge, which we would find here, outreach follow-up discharge adult, um, before you would um, put an end date in the role. Um, you can do both, but the discharge is definitely more important. Okay, so roles are important for a client too because they will um, they will dictate one showing up in reports. So the reporting for your shelter is is largely filtered on roles. And two, it also will determine what tabs show up for this person. For instance, if I remove the outreach follow-up role for Linda, the, these outreach intake and discharges will disappear for her. She will not be able to fill those out. And um, 
And so we want to make sure that they have the roles that they need in order to be able to fill out the data that they that they um, need to fill out and also so that they uh, show up in the uh, reports that they need to show up in. So um, that's how roles work in Outcome Tracker and that's how you add a role. Um, and that, so we went over how to search for a person, how to add a role. So let's say you search for a person and you cannot find their record. Let's go to people organization. Let's say, um, let's say we search for, um, let's say we search for, uh, Oh, she's in there. Uh, let's say, let's say Bart Simpson, also in there. Uh, well, um, let's say we, let's just say for sake of argument that um, we search for somebody and they're not in there. We don't find them. First thing we'll do is make sure that the all uh, role is um, uh, selected, um, and then. So once we so make sure that the all all roles are selected here, and then um, search for their name. And if you still don't don't get the result for the person that you're looking for, you you might have approximate matches like we had when we searched for Linda. There's also Tina. You might have approximate matches, um, which may mean that that person's related. It may not mean anything. It may just mean that they're very close. Um, if there, for instance, if we search for Jane Doe, and there's a Jane row um, in the uh, in the database th that'll show up as an approximate count even the even the approximate match even though those two people may have nothing to do with each other we search we don't find the name we want we go to add new person which is over here in the upper right hand corner in tasks add new person fill out their name um, let's put Jane Doe um, let's say junior um, and then uh, let's give them, let's say that they're a residential client, a residential adult client. Uh, this is another place that you will assign roles as well as the role tab. When you, when you um, add a person, you have to give them a role to, by default. So often actually the, the role that a person will, will start out with is caller. So because they're calling and asking about services. So actually let's give them the role of caller because that's most likely the first role that that a person who um, is accessing services will have is caller. So let's add that. And now we see we have a new, um, a new uh, cl uh, client file for Dame Joe. Jane Doe Jr. And we also notice that there are far fewer tabs for this person than there was for Linda Belcher. That's because this person only has one role, the role of caller, for which there aren't very many applicable um, tabs. There's calls, contacts, and then there's um, the default ones that show up for pretty much everybody, and that's it. Um, so that is how you input a new staff record. Um, again, the role um, the role informs what tabs will be available. Um, uh, and now let's do a quick uh, brief discussion over the roles. Um, so we see we have a, lo a lot of roles here, and this is a point where your um, your shelter will likely depart from ACWS. Your, your shelter will likely have fewer roles than we have, or it may have more, but the, they will likely be um, different. Um, the list will be, be a little bit different, but there should be, um, there should always be um, these two roles, outreach, follow-up, ACWS, adult and child, and residential ACWS, adult and child. Those four roles, represent the the majority of roles in ACWS, the majority of people in ACWS. Um, and obviously, and this is for outreach clients who are adults and outreach clients who are children and residential clients who are adults and residential clients who are children. Then on top of that, there's also caller and or 
potential client, both of these are effectively the same thing. Um, if you put in potential client or caller, they, excuse me, they have the same exact result. And so, um, and so, and they will show up in reporting in the same way. So they're essentially the same role for all intents and purposes. Um, I use caller and I, I mostly because it's higher up on the list, I don't have to scroll down to see it. It's just right there, bam, caller. Um, but uh, the way that um, services typically will work is that person will call in asking for services, they'll be admitted, and when they call in, you put them in the database as caller or potential client, and uh, and when and if they are admitted to the residential program, you'll then assign them, like let's just say Jane Doe is admitted to the, the residential program, I'll assign Jane Doe the role of residential adult, add that, and now if I refresh, you'll see there are a lot more tabs available to them for data entry. And then uh, often what will happen is after they're, um, after they're a residential adult, they'll become an outreach client. So at that point, when, when they become an outreach client, I'll add that role. And if I refresh, then you'll see that there's the outreach discharge and follow up um, that show up. <clears throat> so, so that's usually how, that's usually the pattern that um, that that people follow when they're seeking services from shelters is caller residential outreach. It's not always the case. Sometimes people go into outreach before they go into residential. Um, yeah, but that's typically the 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 like uh, path to service for, um, or I guess in this case path of service for um, clients and shelter. So I'm going to take a brief pause here and um, ask if there are any questions or comments. It doesn't sound like there are any, it doesn't look like there are any questions or comments. <clears throat> so I think the most important takeaway from from that little section is just to make sure that the all tabs, the all roles tab is, uh, so are all roles are selected when you're searching for a person, otherwise you run the risk of filtering them out of your search result. And the path of the path of service for most um, clients in shelter goes from caller or potential client to residential to outreach, and and you, now you know how to add those roles um, as they become applicable to a client. Entering data, um, call contact will most likely be the first activity, followed by intake. Um, activities and services engaged and then discharge. So for and so let's go into outcome tracker here. Let's um, let's look for Jane Doe. Here we go. We want Jane Doe two. So we'll see here. Um, I'm going to add the role of caller and then refresh here. So we'll see here that there's a calls contacts tab. This is something that you fill out when you have a, um, a call contact with a person. Um, and you'll see that there are some fields that are highlighted in red. And those are fields that are um, especially important to ACWS um, and the province, your provincial reporting uh, partners for the reporting requirements. So these fields have to be filled out. Um, and so these, these fields will definitely be on this form for you. Um, gender, type of program, uh, type of request. Everything else may be on there. 
um, and it may not be. So just keep that in mind. Um, all these other additional questions, they may not be on your um, on your call contact form, but these definitely will be. Um, so you'll fill out a call contact whenever you get a call, um, type of request, um, uh, residential admission request, that's pretty self-explanatory. Information request um, is about um, requesting information on services other than residential or maybe residential if they're not actually requesting admission, they're just curious about it. Crisis support, uh, client-related call would be people who are calling shelter for a client or or um, re or calls related to a client. Um, yeah, so those are the type of requests. So after you fill out a call contact, uh, most likely it will be a residential admission request. And then uh, you'll see once I select that, there's some more fields that pop up. Um, admitted to program, and then uh, and then no for this. Um, once a person is admitted, you're probably gonna want you're gonna want to fill out an intake. So um, again, because the person so uh, so once a person is admitted and call contact, let's I'm just gonna go back and retract here for a second. Once a person is admitted. Um, and the call contact, uh, what I would do is um, is go to roles, um, add the residential role. Of course, this person already has it because we added it earlier a moment ago, but we'll add, um, uh, we, uh, add the residential role and then fill out a residential intake for adults which will show up now because we have the residential uh, role in Outcome Tracker. Um, it's the same story with, um, with the um, residential intake form as it was with the call contact form. There are some questions that are required, type of program, primary family member, province, region, all of these are required if they're in red. The other ones are just questions that your shelter may want you to answer and may not most likely most of these will not be on your on your form you'll see there's a lot of them on here uh, most likely most of these will not be on your shelter's intake form um, but it's just important to remember to fill out every any um, any um, field that is highlighted in red okay so that's the residential intake. Um, let's look here. Um, so once a person is admitted, they might have uh, activities that they do related to their uh, residential stay or their outreach participation. So for instance, uh, one that happens a lot is a danger assessment. Uh, some shelters will do a danger assessment for every uh, residential client. Um, they might do a PSI, which is a parental stress, parental stress index. Um, acuity scale is coming. We have that in our database, but it's not quite available yet for members, but hopefully soon that will be out there. So you might do, acuity, might do an acuity scale. So those um, are just some things that you might do. I'm not going to walk through each and every one of these just because um, we, we have a, it would, uh, we have, they're not applicable to everybody and we have a little bit of a time crunch here, but just know that um, typically once you in, once you intake a client, you'll typically have, you know, a danger assessment to do or maybe some case notes you want to put in, things like that. Um, and then uh, this is just the sort of typical data entry process, call contact, intake, activities, and then a discharge. Uh, eventually, you're going to want to discharge this person. So let's just say, let's let's put in a quick, um, so province is pretty self-explanatory, primary family member. Um, I'm not going to walk through all the definitions just because um, uh, it'll take it would take a while and all these definitions are available for reference in the manual and I think it's probably more um, more um, 
useful for you to just reference the manual than just have me walk through what they mean. Admission data is pretty self-explanatory. Family composition, uh, is she's a single client, which means that she doesn't have kids. We'll walk through, um, we'll walk through later what, what it means. Um, uh, we'll walk through later how to link children to adults. Uh, gender, uh, no. Was the client born in Canada? Yes. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Types of abuse. Uh, this is something we can walk through while we're here. Types of abuse you'll see is sort of different. It's not a drop down like most of the other fields. This is because you can select more than one. And to do that, um, you will press select one and then press control on your keyboard and then select another one. Um, if you if if more than one are applicable, uh, it may be just that one is applicable. You don't have to select more than one. Uh, enrollment linking, um, we would want to do uh, link to a call contact. We don't have a call contact saved for this person actually. That's why this is blank. But um, typically, what you would want to do is link to the call contact that resulted in admission. So when a um, when a client is seeking admission to shelter, they will typically call multiple times before they're actually able to be admitted. So that is why we want to enrollment link to the to the call that will um, that resulted in their admission. And so I'm going to save this missing fields. So um, this happens sometimes. So we'll just go through and look at all the red fields and make sure that they're that they're completed. Oh, here we go. This is why. Oops, that's not me. That's me. Save. Sometimes it takes a moment to save. There we go. Saved. Okay. So now we have a residential intake for them. Uh, let's say they've been in for three or four days or maybe a, a week or two and they need to be discharged. So we'll go over to the residential discharge and you'll see here that there is a link that we that they were admitted on 730, which is today, 2019. Um, so we want to make sure that this is selected. If they have been admitted more than one time, there'll be several admissions here. Um, on the side, and we just want to make sure that we select the right one um, before we um, get started. One thing you don't want to do when it comes to discharges is because of the way it works in Outcome Tracker, you don't want to copy and you don't want to create a new enrollment. Um, you'll see here in uh, residential intake, the residential intake form. Um, there's an option to create a new residential intake for for the for adults. Um, that is something you'll probably want to do every once in a while for the re residential intake. But for the discharge, you never want to do that. And actually, that option should not be available to you. Um, sometimes, somehow, it it gets set back there, the option to create a new discharge. But you never want to do that because um, that will not link the discharge and the intake. Um, it's a little technical how it works, so I, I won't get into that exactly, but just know that when you uh, go to fill out the residential discharge for adults, you want to make sure that you have the right one selected. So right now there's only one because this client has only been uh, admitted once, but if they've been admitted multiple times, there will be many, uh, many links down here uh, to choose from, and we just want to make sure that we want to select the right one. And then we'll fill out the discharge the way we fill out the rest of the forms. Um, just make sure that the red the red fields are filled in, and then of course any other um, any other um, fields that your shelter um, is uh, making a point to track. Oh, we definitely want a discharge date. <laughs> Let's go ahead and put that in. All right, so that is the entering data tip. How entering data typically goes. Um, so, so let's go over some common data errors, duplicate records. Um, so sometimes when you search for a person, 
you may accidentally have a role on filter that you didn't mean to have and then so your person doesn't come up and when you go to add new person and put them in you'll get uh actually i'll just show you you'll get a um oops you'll get a um, thing saying there's a duplicate, there's possible duplicates here. Um, if you go to add new, what that does is it creates a, a duplicate record. Um, and you, normally when, when um, we find that when, when basic um, users are entering data, they'll, go, they'll click add new because they don't really understand what this means. Um, so one thing I will suggest is if you ever get this screen where it talks about having uh, possible duplicates, cancel, go back and make sure that you have this all selected, then search for your person again and make sure that you that you have done that. Um, sometimes what happens is that you have people with very similar names that are actually separate people, in which case what you would want to do is add a new person. Um, but sometimes there's duplicate records um, just so you know, um, if you ever get this screen, um, just make sure that you make sure that you're positive that this person is separate from like these two people and isn't actually one of them. And then if 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 that's the case, then add new. If it isn't the case, go back and make sure you, you search um, again uh, with the all uh, roles selected. Um, so. That's how you make duplicate records. And if you do accidentally make a duplicate record, uh, you need to take that to your OT admin because um, uh, basic users typically don't have the um, permissions required to uh, resolve the issues around a duplicate record. Um, so if that happens, then you should take it to your OT admin. And it does happen. It's not a huge deal. It's just something that you, um, you need to make your OT uh, admin aware of. Um, types of abuse leading to admission. This is, let's go back to Jane Doe. Um, this is a, a form on the residential intake, a field on the residential intake form and is a required field. Um, I This is on the list because, um, let me find, let me find it, type. Of abuse leading to admission. Here we go. Um, this is on the this is on this list of common data errors because sometimes what happens is that there's no um, there's no abuse uh, listed, and um, and this is a unique field in Outcome Tracker because this is one field that is read. Um, that is a provincial reporting requirement that you might actually want to leave blank. Because if there is no abuse reported by the, um, by the client, um, rather than putting an unknown or putting, a, putting uh, something in here, then um, you'll want to leave it blank. Um, so so uh, it's on this list of data, common data errors because it is unique among the re re provincial reporting requirement fields in that you might actually leave it blank. There are circumstances under which you would leave it blank. Um, uh, role dates, um, as I said earlier, um, uh, admission, or sorry, as I said earlier, um, role end dates are not always necessary. But if you do use role end dates, I, uh, we just advise you to make sure that your role end date matches the discharge date for that for that role. So, for instance, um, this person was discharged on from their residential from the residential program on August first. So I would go to roles um, and click on edit and select August 1st as the roll in date and then save. It just helps us um, make sure that the person gets um, put into whatever um, put into whatever um, field they need to be put into. So we do have a question. Um, for homelessness, what type of um, 
what type of, of abuse would you select? And that is one of those instances in which you would leave it blank. Um, that is a common error, uh, that is a common issue that we get. Um, a, a person is not necessarily a victim of abuse, they are homeless. And for those instances, you would leave type of abuse blank. Um, yeah, so that so that so that's the answer to that question. So um, if if the type of abuse is not applicable for any reason, just leave them blank. And often that reason is because the person is is homeless rather than a victim of abuse. Um, so yeah, that that's the answer to that question. Um, uh, dependent questions. Um, let's, we'll cover that a little bit later. Relationships. Okay, so um, I'm gonna, for this one, I'm going to go back to Linda Belcher. Um, okay, so when you have, uh, when you enter a child, you'll enter them uh, much the same as an adult. You'll go to add new person. And you'll select the, for instance, residential uh, child role or the outreach child role rather than the residential adult or residential ch or outreach adult role. So um, that is how you uh, would do that. But once they're in, once they're uh, in the system, you'll need you need a way to link the mother, uh, the parent who is who is usually the mother and the child um, in, a, in a meaningful way, an outcome tracker. And the way we do that is with relationships. So there should be a tab for either, you can do it on either end, the mother's end or the child's end, it doesn't matter. Um, but there should be a tab in their, um, in their file called relationships. So we'll click on that. And we'll see here that um, this relationship is already set up. I'm gonna delete this and add it again, just so I can walk you through the process. So we're in, so Tina Belcher has been added to the database. Um, she needs to be linked to Linda Belcher in a meaningful way um, in relationships. So uh, I'll go to Linda Belcher's file or Tina, I can do it from either end, and go to the relationships tab and go to add. And I wanna make sure so Linda is the mother, and just because of the way it works with with the the we needed to create a relationship that would be applicable to almost every single relationship in which there's a dependent and a caretaker in the shelter at the same time or in services at the same time. So what we came up with is a primary family member and member family member. So so almost all of the time the primary family member is going to be the mom rather than you know the father or the grandfather or the grandmother sometimes it happens that it's the grandmother or the or or some other some other relationship but in this case um, it's the mom so um, I'm on Linda Belcher's file I can see that up here the name is Linda Belcher so I want to make her the primary family member of and then I'll start typing in a name um, and then the name will automatically populate. I'll put that up there and click add. And now I see that this relationship is, is um, active. And then um, I can click on the related person's name that will take me to their file. So now I see I'm in Tina Belcher's file and in Tina Belcher's file on the relationships tab, I see that she has a relationship a family member to Linda Belcher. So when you create that link, it creates it on both ends. So uh, that's how you add relationships. And you wanna do that for every um, every client you see in, uh, in Shelter who is, um, every client you see in Shelter who is admitted with um, with children, um, you'll want to create that relationship with um, between the mother and children. So, for instance, if Linda had more than one child, I would go to add primary family member, and then search for that person's for that child's name, and then it'll show up here as well. Um, so that is how you add relationships. Um, common definitions that are confusing. 
Um, often I find that the, the biggest one that we get is around type of abuse, which we already explained. Um, and I think um, because we're running low on time here, um, all the definitions are in um, all the definitions are in the basic user manual. Um, so if you just have a question about definitions, I would result I would refer to that because I think it's more useful for you to um, refer to that than just to have me go over um, any um, any questions. Um, deleting accidental enrollments and enrollment linking. Uh, let's go over that real quick. Um, so let's say um, a person was accidentally, you, let's just say you're on the danger assessment tab for Linda Belcher. You're just looking around to see, maybe you're wanting to know if they have any danger assessments that have been previously entered in. And um, let's say by accident you enter in, you enter in a danger assessment. Like, uh, oh, oh no, now they have a danger assessment for this day that I didn't mean to put in. Okay, what you'll do if you accidentally enter data that you don't mean to, you'll go to the, uh, um, where is it? It's called activity, activity list, here it is. Um, you'll go to the activity list, and this is a list of everything that this person has been uh, enrolled in, um, by date. So we see here this danger assessment um, that was filled out for today. We'll click on that and then um, click unenroll. Unenroll is the same thing as deleting. And in fact, when you click it and ask if you want to delete, so we'll just click delete. So that's how you, um, if you accidentally enroll somebody in an activity, which is to say if you accidentally put in data that you don't mean to put in, um, you will go to the activity list and uh, look at the list of activities that they've been that they've been enrolled in, and um, and choose the one that is accidental. Click on it and unenroll them in it. Um, so that is that. So let's talk about enrollment linking. So the biggest, the most important place where you enrollment link is for calls. And um, this person doesn't have the caller role, so I'm going to add the caller role for them. Um, and then I'm going to refresh so that we get the call contacts tab. So the most important place that you will enrollment link is between calls and um, And residential intakes. Sorry, I was uh, I was filling this out real quick. We should put a date on this. Oh, it's already in there uh, for today. Okay, so let's go ahead and save that. And once we save that, um, uh, we'll see if we go back to the residential intake. Um, it's taking a moment to load. If we unlock it here, if we go to the bottom here, there's enrollment link, and we'll see now that there is a call contact um, from today with residential admission requests. So we'll want to select that. This is the most important place where enrollment linking comes into play. So what enrollment linking does is basically tells outcome tracker and us that this this thing is related to this other thing. So this admission is related to this call contact. So we, it's important for us to know which, which call contact actually led to the admission. As I said earlier, people call typically a few times before they're actually admitted. So it's important for us to know which call contact led to the admission. Typically there'll be many call contacts in this list, in this drop-down list here, and we'll have to select which one actually resulted in the admission, which we'll be able to distinguish between them because there's different dates on them, hopefully, um, unless they're calling multiple times a day. Um, and then 
And so then we'll know which one uh, resulted in the admission. Another place in which um, enrollment linking is important is in something like uh, danger assessment. So I'm gonna leave this. Um, and this is a little bit different. Um, oh, the enrollment link is on there. Um, um, well, something like the danger assessment or the DVSA or the acuity scale or other things that you might fill out for this person because those don't link to call contacts but rather to admissions. So admission, admission intakes link to call contacts and then everything else that links to other everything else links to admissions. So if I fill out a danger assessment or I fill out an uh, acuity scale, I want to make sure that I link that to the admission that it's applicable to, um, just to make sure we know which, uh, which admission is this referring to. Um, so that's that. Um, are there any questions or comments about that? Or are there any, um, oh, we already did enrollment linking and relationships and admissions to multiple programs. Oh, so I think we might be pretty much done then. Um, this is arranged bizarrely, which is only my fault. I arranged it. <laughs> but um, so are there any questions? Are there maybe perhaps common def or, or definitions that you found confusing or any questions about enrollment linking? I know we breezed through some of these things pretty quickly, um, but this will be available on the YouTube channel for reference. So you can reference it pretty regularly um, and, and go through it more slowly or multiple times if you want. Um, I'm hoping to have this up and um, and available um, definitely by the by the end of this week. So I'll I will make sure to send it to um, to all of you who are here uh, today. In addition to the OT admins who I normally send it to. Um, but um, are there any questions or concerns that people had about this training? Questions or comments? Um, don't forget that this handout, this um, PowerPoint is available to you in the um, panel, the GoToWebinar go to panel under handouts. Um, and you might want that because it does have the link to the YouTube channel um, with all the OT support videos um, where this video will eventually be once I get it uploaded. Um, we do have a question here. Let's take a look at it. What is the difference between family member and relationships? Okay, so relationships are sort of the category under which family members resides. Um, so let's take a look at the relationships tab real quick. If I can find it, it is sometimes difficult to find. Here we go, relationships. Um, so uh, Linda Belcher is a primary family member of Tina Belcher. Another relationship that people, <coughs> oh, excuse me. Another relationship that people keep a track keep track of is victim and abuser. Um, some shelters will put abusers into the database and and forge the relationship between the victim and abuser. Um, other people will um, will not. Um, another relationship that uh, people use is organization and staff contact. That is more administrative. That's less to do with entering client data and more just keeping track of, of contact information and outcome trackers. Some shelters do that, some, some don't. Um, so um, relationships are sort of an umbrella under which family members fall, but also a few other things fall. Um, all these WPT, WTPT are probably not relevant to your shelter, so I'm not going to walk through those, but those are abuser and victim and organization staff contact are also um, 
also relationships that you might use in your data entry process. But most likely when you deal with relationships, you'll be dealing with primary family member and family member. Um, so um, I hope that answers your question. Uh, oh, this just uh, sort of, the, uh, so another question is about, about the family members tab. Actually, this tab is probably not in your database. Um, this is just sort of uh, a, a uh, <clears throat> what do they call it, like a um, summary tab. It just gives you uh, information about the people who are related to this person um, in this person's file, so you don't have to go to the other pe people's file, which is useful um, if there are if a, if a mother has multiple children, then then uh, all their information will be displayed here, um, but. Uh, this this tab is is probably not even in your database because it's sort of a um, a, a, a additional tab that most people don't find terribly useful. But if you do find it useful and you want it, um, we can definitely put it in there. Um, so um, I think I think that's it. We are out of time. Thank you all for attending. And oh, there's a there's a quick survey. Uh, at the end of the webinar, so when I when I close the webinar, you'll be taken to a quick survey, just to gauge your satisfaction with the webinar, um, and and ask you a few questions. If you can fill that out, it should take less than five minutes. Um, that would be really helpful for us. And again, I know it says my name is Christy, but this is actually Christoph. Um, it says it's Christy because that was the, the default. Anyway, it's not important, but. Um, uh, if you fill out the survey, um, that would be really useful for us. And I hope that you have learned something new. And I hope that um, this has been helpful. And um, uh, I hope to chat with you soon. Thanks. Um, bye.